Welcome. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. Uh, this is the launch the launch of the fifth Global Electricity Review, which is providing the first comprehensive overview of changes in the global electricity system for last year, as well as freely publishing the data from 215 countries, which you can uh, find on our website and explore for yourself. Uh, I'm Phil McDonald. I'm the Managing Director of Ember. The organisation has now grown to 60 people, which is quite incredible around the world. Uh, and most of them contributed in some way to the Global Electricity Review, and a few of them are, are here today. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by some of the, the key contributors uh, as well. Uh, later on, we're going to have a panel with some great thinkers uh, on the electricity transition from around the world. Before I uh, before we introduce the speakers, just going to give a little bit of context um, to, to set the scene for where we are. So uh, I think most of you will know that the clean power sector is the world's best hope for tackling climate change. Uh, with clean electricity, we can clean up not only the, the power sector, but every other sector, from heat to transport to industry. Uh, and in the analysis you're about to hear, we aren't going to sugarcoat it. Uh, it did, uh, in 2023, the transition ran into some significant challenges. Uh, growth in new clean power, whilst it's uh, growing faster than wind and solar, growing faster than any other technology and ever before, uh, it's still not happening fast enough. Previously stable, reliable sources like hydropower have come under un unprecedented stress in the last year. But there are grounds for hope, enormous grounds for hope. 2024 looks like it'll be a historic year. Um, we're now likely past the peak of emissions, and for the first time, we'll enter into a new era of falling global power sector emissions, and with them, total global uh, emissions too. Humanity has turned a corner, and that is particularly down to the extraordinary growth in solar, which we're going to focus on in this presentation. The world is on a pathway to an electricity system that no longer contributes to climate change. But it's, un it's unclear whether this momentum that we built up to get to this peak will then see a gentle downhill or emissions will fall off a cliff. Only one of these scenarios leads to a safe climate. What happens next is up to us. And there's an enormous opportunity now to build these cheaper, more resilient energy systems. Energy systems which aren't reliant on distant countries. Uh, it's a global prize for the societies that can transition fastest. Ember is here to help them do it. So it gives me great pleasure to hand the chairing of this event to Sibi Arasu. Uh, Sibi is a climate journalist for the Associated Press based in India. He's worked for more than a decade covering climate and environment, garnering many awards for his work. So we're in very good hands. Sibi, over to you. <clears throat> thanks, Phil, and uh, thanks, Ember. Really happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> many of you might have seen the AP story yesterday about how this uh, summer and this year is proving to be uh, quite mind-boggling even for climate scientists, the number of extreme weather events happening around the world. And surely one of the um, uh, last standing chances to prevent such catastrophe from continuing or at least relatively reducing is to shift to clean energy. And um, it's really good that and for any transition to happen, of course, you need accountability. And it's really great that Ember, whose work I've been closely following here in Asia, and I know that they do great work in other parts of the world, have come up with this report. Um, I'm really excited to hear from the panelists as well as the experts who will be, uh, uh, be talking with us later. And um, I think it'll be best to hand it over to the Ember analysts now, Dave, Katie, Nicholas, and Costanza, and we can uh, come back to the panel discussion. Uh, please take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sibi. Um, yeah, welcome to the launch of the Global Electricity Review 2024. Uh, my name is Nicholas Fulgham, and alongside with my colleagues, I'll be taking you through the findings in our latest report on the global electricity system. So we're going to start with a quick overview of what's inside the report this year. So in the Global Electricity Review 2024, we're taking a detailed look at the changes in the electricity sector in 2023. We're providing analysis on the key trends that are shaping the global electricity transition. And we also include a deep dive into the electricity trends of major countries and regions, as well as different electricity sources. 
This report, as Phil has already mentioned, provides the first comprehensive data and review on the global electricity system in 2023. For this purpose, we've collected and analyzed the latest 2023 data for 80 countries. This is what allows us to give the first accurate picture of the electricity transition last year. And with the report, we provide data on electricity generation from all main electricity sources, as well as, as, well as emissions, demand, and electricity imports. Now, tracking the power sectors of these countries means tracking 90% of global power sector emissions. And 90% of global power sector emissions are also a third of the total global CO2 emissions. And this is exactly why tracking this data on the global power sector is so vitally important. At the same time, this also means that improving data access and transparency in regions where this information isn't available will be key to track the progress in moving to a decarbonized power sector, especially as electricity demand in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East is set to rise. And for this reason, our data already covers more than 200 countries for the period of 2000 to 2022. So we can see those transitions happen as well. Now, beyond the global electricity review, we always have all of our latest monthly and annual data openly available on our website and on our data explorer. And we're regularly updating them throughout the year. The global electricity re review is a snapshot, but we want to provide active, continuous coverage of the electricity transition. So please go over there as well and explore the data for yourself. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Constanza, for the key findings. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, today, me and my colleagues, we present to you four key findings from the report. One, renewables hit a record 30% of global electricity in 2023, and this was led by solar. And my colleague Katie will talk uh, more about this uh, in a second. Two, power sector emissions rose in 2023, and this was largely because of low hydro. Four, 2024 will likely begin a new era <coughs> of falling power sector emissions. So now I would like to uh, hand over to Katie to present the first key insight about renewables hitting 30%. Katie, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Costanza. So I'll start by discussing the record rise of renewables now that we've hit 30% share of electricity generation. So first, here we can see the share of global electricity generation from renewables. So with hydro in blue, wind and solar in green, and other renewables in light blue. What you can see is a further 10% from nuclear, which leaves 60% electricity generation from fossil fuels. But if you look at the green over time, you can see that the share of wind and solar rose from less than 1% in the year 2000 to just over 13% in the year in 2023. And so this strong growth in wind and solar is what drove the share of renewables in the global electricity mix above 30% for the first time. Now we can also look at an annual view. So here this graphic shows the annual change in electricity generation. We're focusing on solar and green and wind and blue. 2023 was the second year in which global solar growth, uh, global growth in solar generation outpaced wind growth. And you can see that in the 2022 and 2023 bars. One of the reasons for a fall in the growth of wind generation last year is that the US experienced lower than average wind speeds. But ultimately it's a solar story. Solar was the fastest growing source of electricity generation for the 19th year in a row, adding more than twice as much new electricity as coal in 2023. And this graphic shows a global view, but we also do have country level data. And if we look and drill down into that, we can see that China was the main contributor, accounting for just over half of the additional global solar generation last year and 60% of new global wind generation. Other big contributors to global wind growth include the EU and Brazil, and other big contributors to global solar growth include the EU and the US. And to put this growth into context, this graphic here shows a normalized view of the growth of different electricity sources. And one thing you can see in light gray in the top, yes, nuclear saw fast growth after it passed 100 terawatt hours in 1971. But no other sources of electricity have ever grown from 100 terawatt hours to 1,000 terawatt hours faster than wind and solar, which you can see in the dark green and the light green. 
And this rapid wind and solar scale up has been achieved by countries with different geographies, different stages of economic development, different political systems, lots of variability. Overall, this demonstrates that we do have the tools necessary to make this fast change happen in power sectors across the globe. And we'll just take one more moment to look at the scale of solar capacity additions, because it truly is remarkable. If we look on the left here in green, are solar capacity additions from 2016 to 2022. And on the right are the capacity additions that would be needed to meet solar's contribution to the IEA net zero scenario. And as recent as the end of 2021, expectations for solar capacity in 2023 were quite modest, such that the road to meeting the expected share of solar capacity in the net zero scenario required a rapid ramp up in solar capacity additions from now to 2030. And so we can see that with one more click here, that's at the end of 2021. But during 2023, expectations for solar really jumped. And so you can see from the end of 2022 to the beginning of 2024, there was a big increase in the forecast for what was gonna happen in 2023. And, but interestingly, even then, that underestimated what actually happened. And so the actual capacity added, which is record setting, was even higher. And what that means is that you can see the light green line. Now the road to meeting solar share of the IA net zero scenario is much less steep and much more achievable. Thank you, Katie. And now uh, let me present the second key insight from the report, which is about what happened to uh, power sector emissions in 2023 and what happened to the global electricity mix. And as you will see, power sector emissions would have fallen for the first year, but drought conditions meant that hydro saw a record fall and coal had to rise to fill the gap. On this chart, you see annual change in each source measured in terawatt hours and wind and solar with the fastest rises, adding just over 500 terawatt hours of additional electricity generation in 2023. This means that in 2023, wind and solar met the majority or 82% of electricity demand growth on the global level. Next, nuclear and renewables increased only marginally, however, and they added only a fraction of the electricity added by wind and solar. The rise in nuclear and other renewables was more than offset by a record fall in hydro generation. And as a result, total clean electricity growth was not enough to meet the entirety of demand growth and both coal and gas generation increased slightly to meet the shortfall. And as a result, global power sector emissions rose by 1%. Now, the record fall in hydro generation was a considerable and unexpected challenge. There were already two years of droughts. As you can see in 2021, there was a very sharp fall, as you can see on the right side of the graphic, which shows the annual changes in terawatt hours. And there was almost no recovery in 2022. And instead of having some, smile, some small further recovery in 2023, aided, aided by the fact that there were also additional seven gigawatts of new hydro capacity added, we actually saw the largest annual fall in hydro in that year. So as you can see on the left side of the graphic, which shows the outright or total uh, generation from hydro, 2023 was a five-year low. Now, still the global electricity mix became cleaner uh, despite that global emissions rose by 1%, as you can see from this chart. It shows the emission intensity of power generation measured in grams of CO2 emitted per kilowatt hour produced for the world and for key countries and regions. Strong wind and solar growth made sure that the increase in fossil generation was smaller than the increase in demand. This means that fossil fuels lost market share to clean power, making the mix cleaner. And this takes us to our next insight, because while renewables are growing, making the electricity mix cleaner, so is electricity demand. Now let's look at what happened in 2023. This chart that you will see uh, shows you the change in global electricity demand last year in terawatt hours split into key countries and regions. And what you will notice immediately is how China remained the main driver of global demand growth in 2023 with an increase that was only slightly smaller than the total global demand increase. 
Meanwhile, demand in advanced economies, and especially the EU and the US, fell. And as a result, overall global demand growth was below trend. Now, our monthly data shows some important nuance to this message. Global demand growth was weak at the start of 2023. The effect of the energy crisis following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which affected also demand in 2022, was still very much apparent at the beginning of 23. However, demand growth gradually accelerated over the course of the year, and it was growing faster already in late 2023, and this continued over the first three months of 2024. Over January and March this year, demand was 5.3% higher than the same period in 2023, which is a significant increase. And while our data shows clearly in which countries electricity demand is growing, we wanted to dive deeper and better understand the underlying drivers of this demand growth. On this chart, you can see how demand grew by 2.2% in 2023 from the bottom bar, uh, gray bar on this chart. And above it, you can see our estimate of how much each uh, different sources uh, or different drivers contributed to this 2.2% growth. What we uncovered is that more than half of global growth in electricity demand in 2023 came from just five but fast growing technologies. EVs and heat pumps, which you can see at the top, are already being deployed at a massive scale and contributing to reducing fossil fuel demand outside the power sector. Demand from air conditioners and data centers is also substantial, and it contributed as much as EVs and heat pumps to global demand growth in 2023. These five technologies are already growing uh, fast and will be growing even faster going forward. So we are now entering a new era of faster electricity demand growth. And because these technologies are contributing so much to electricity demand growth and their role will continue growing, it's really important to set the right efficiency standards for these technologies to make sure that we are avoiding wasteful electricity demand. And with this, I would like to give the floor to Dave, who will present our last key insight from the report. Dave, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much, Annie. And um, just a reminder, there's, um, there is a Q&A button just in case you want to put any question in. We always enjoy answering. Um, so, yeah, so now I'd like to present our forecast for 2024 and why we believe that 2024 will likely begin a new era of falling power sector emissions. First, a reminder about how wind and solar have what they've already achieved. Um, here's the history of world electricity generation. Fossil generation in black rose at 1% per year in the last 10 years, compared to 3% in the 10 years before. So wind and solar have already been fundamental in slowing the rise of fossil generation growth. And in fact, in, uh, in fact that, with that rising green wedge, had that instead been met with fossil generation um, and wind and solar wasn't there, then in 2023, fossil fuel use in the power sector would have been 22% higher than it actually was. So here's our forecast for 2024. We forecast that 2024 will be a bumper year for renewables generation. You can see in bright green solar generation as twice as much in 2024 as in 2023. And the build-out of solar stepped up so dramatically only towards the end of 2023. And that means we're only going to see that full effect actually happening in 2024. Wind generation will rise more than, 20, than in 2023, which is held back by low wind speeds. And hydro will likely see a big rise after three years of droughts. We've entered a new period of renewables growth. And in 2024, it will get real for the first time. On the gray bar on the right-hand side, you can see that global electricity demand is likely to grow much faster uh, than it was last year. The boom in renewables, however, will be more than compensate for the higher electricity demand growth. And that means that fossil generation will fall. We estimate it will fall by 333 terawatt hours, which is about 2% fall in fossil uh, global fossil generation and about a 2% fall in global power sector emissions. Now, the latest tracking um, of monthly data during 2024, we think that we're all still on track to deliver this. Instead of looking at the rise in actual 
um, clean generation, we look at clean generation calculated from year end capacity additions and assuming typical load factors, then we can see that actually there was enough clean capacity already added in 2023 to meet demand growth and to reduce emissions. It didn't happen that way in part because hydro generation fell, but it's interesting that we were already structurally building enough renewables last year to uh, enable um, a, a fall in fossil generation. And with 2024, we're transitioning to an era of higher electricity demand growth as that blue line lifts up. But the industry forecasts for wind and solar growth more than make up for that. All this means that we can be quite sure that emissions will not only fall in 2022, but rather every year to begin a new era of falling fossil use in the power sector. This pathway for how fast emissions will fall is not yet set. The more focus we have on efficiency to limit that rise in electricity demand, the more emissions will fall. And the closer we get to the global renewables tripling, tripling goal that global leaders agreed uh, to at the COP28 climate conference last December, the more renewables growth will exceed these industry forecasts and the more emissions will fall. So I just like to end the presentation mentioning two countries that from our generation data have shown just how fast progress is possible. First, Brazil. On the left, you can see wind and solar growth has met all of new electricity demand growth in the last 10 years. It's a global leader in solar and wind, recording the second largest additions of any country in 2023. And that's kept Brazil's dominance as a renewables powerhouse, building off its legacy hydro dominance. And that means that Brazil, um, amidst fast rising demand growth, has avoided a major increase in power emissions and that fossil generation uh, in 2023 remained less than 10% of its electricity. Uh, the second country uh, we wanted to highlight was the Netherlands. The Netherlands has one of the fastest adopters of uh, wind and solar in the world, as wind and solar generation have grown to 40% of electricity generation. The Netherlands, despite its high latitude, now has the second highest per capita solar generation in the world, and even more wind generation. And this has all led to emissions intensity of Dutch electricity having halved in just eight years. The build out of wind and solar was largely driven by climate legislation. So in 2019, the Dutch government agreed legally binding targets to reduce CO2 emissions by 2030, which necessitated a phase out of coal power and also a phase down in gas generation as well. So four takeaways that I'd love to leave you with. First, that we've hit a 30% milestone of global electricity from renewables in 2023. This would rise to 60% by 2030 if we were able to achieve the goal of tripling renewable electricity capacity. Second, the rise in solar really is bending that curve of possibility. Not only have solar panels halved in price in the last 12 months, but batteries have too, and solar paired with batteries are a formidable combination. It's possible if governments wanted, the world could hit that 60% renewables. And just one or two years ago, it, it really didn't seem as possible as it seems now. Third, renewables, um, but also electricity demand is accelerating, in part because of electric cars and heat pumps. This is exciting because renewable electricity will help reduce not just fossil fuel use in the power sector, but fossil fuel use across the entire economy. And that in turn will create even more momentum for renewable capacity to be built. And finally, as we believe power sector emissions fall in 2024 and beyond, that means looking back, 2023 will likely be the historical peak of power sector emissions. Thank you for joining us on here. I'll now hand you back to Sibian. Really looking forward to the discussion that follows. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Dave, uh, and thanks all colleagues for member. This was a really insightful presentation. So we got a great panel here, and uh, the presentation, as all of you know, it is quite optimistic. It is really encouraging to see that you know we are able to produce so much of renewable energy. However, for it to truly make a difference, the global goal to triple renewable capacity agreed by leaders in Dubai last year 
needs to be met, which means that 60% of world's power needs to come from clean energy by the end of this decade. So is this really possible? Like, will we be able to, you know, make that steep decline in fossil energy that is needed to save the world from the worst effects of global warming is the question that really needs to be answered. And uh, to do that, I'd like to call Mr. Bruce Douglas from the Global Renewables Alliance. Uh, the GRA has launched a campaign called Time for Action to turn the vision of this tripling goal into a reality. And they've been looking closely at what needs to happen in this year for this to happen. So Bruce, please uh, go ahead. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thanks, Sibi. Great to be here. And thanks so much for the invitation from Ember. Amazing analysis as always. Just love the, the, the deep dives and the graphs you've produced. Um, so the GRA, the Global Renewables Alliance, we represent uh, solar, wind, hydropower and geothermal on the generation side. But also, interestingly, we represent long duration energy storage and green hydrogen, which we think are essential to, to scale renewables. So the tripling of uh, renewables commitment, as you mentioned, Sibi, uh, COP28 sent a very strong signal. Um, and that combined with the doubling of energy efficiency and the transition away from fossil fuels clearly indicate the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. It's just the beginning though. And the 11,000 gigawatts, we would um, say is really just a minimum target for 2030. It can be achieved, but we're also concerned that there's some big challenges ahead. Um, I'm going to mention three shuns, so uh, electrification, penetration, and uh, acceleration. So first of all, on electrification, uh, the Ember experts gave some really great analysis on demand growth and how renewables are now meeting that demand growth. And I think that is very key going forward. We need to electrify those end use sectors, heating, transport, and industry, and to power those with clean, renewable electricity. Um, the second on penetration. Now, for many years, people were saying that renewables won't reach a penetration or can't even reach a penetration above 5, 10, 15 percent. What you're seeing now, the variable renewables alone, so solar and wind, are already at over 13 percent of, uh, of total electricity and uh, including the very important backbone hydropower. Uh, we're taking it over 30 percent now. If we achieve the tripling, it'll go beyond 60% penetration. Um, but that's a big if. And that's the, the last piece is about uh, acceleration. And Sibi, you asked that about our Time for Action campaign. Well, if you look at the figures, even though we're breaking records every year in terms of renewable installation, we're still way off track. So the 11,000 gigawatts requires approximately three gigawatts built and connected every day between now and 2030. So that's 3,000 megawatts. And as you saw from the figures, um, we're a long way from that. And, and so that's the challenge. The Time for Action campaign we launched, and I'll, I'll highlight four things very quickly in that campaign, is to identify two things. One is long-term planning. So we need the combination, and it's a powerful combination of long-term market signals, um, visibility, um, policy frameworks, combined with some short-term actions. And there's four, four things we've identified. And I'll, I'll list them in an order of um, ease, uh, speed, and even in terms of the cost. So the first one is permitting. This can be addressed very quickly. And this is like a low cost or no cost uh, approach that the governments can already take to accelerate the development of renewables. So what we see is thousands of gigawatts stuck in permitting. That could be addressed by accelerating the timelines for permitting, uh, creating one-stop shops within countries to make it easier digitalizing or standardizing the, the approach for permits. Uh, and finally, to make it um, in the overriding public interest. And you see those four things have been um, introduced at the European level and have started being implemented at uh, member states and countries. And where they have been in implemented, we see a dramatic acceleration of, uh, of development. The second one is grids. And again, thousands of gigawatts are stuck in grid connection queues. We need to reform those queues and identify where the speculative projects are and move forward with the, the more realistic projects as fast as possible. The third is on supply chains, and that involves making stronger and more resilient supply chains. That's more complicated and will take longer than the, the year you're talking about. And finally, and probably most important, but also probably most challenging, is financing. We need to mobilize $10 trillion 
between now and 2030 in order to build out 11,000 gigawatts. Um, and although we, we recognize that the private sector will provide the bulk of that finance, I mean, historically, something like 85% of investments come from the private sector, um, we need public sector support to de-risk projects that can be done in the short term, um, but requires you know, very swift action in the coming months and years. Uh, also, it needs to be done in a balanced way. So 85% of investment were made last year in China, US, and Europe. And that needs to be balanced with the global south. Uh, one example in Africa, for example, is 17% of the world's population is Af in Africa, and less than 2% of clean energy investment is made in Africa. That's not acceptable. That needs to be addressed. And so we are focusing heavily on accelerating financing, especially in emerging markets and developing economies. Again, thank you so much, Sibi, and thanks, Ember, for, for a great report. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I think uh, it'll be good to have the other panelists speak as well before we can take the questions together. So I'd like to call on Uta Collier from Irina next. Uh, as we know, the latest data from IRENA shows that a huge acceleration in renewable capacity is underway right now, mostly because of solar energy. Uh, Uta, could you tell us a bit about the outlook for 2030? What are the key enablers that might enable us to unlock the tripling goal? What are the key gaps that need to be addressed? Thanks, CB, and uh, congratulations from us as well to Ember's excellent new report. Um, yes, so we at IRENA, we actually, we have 169 member states and in every year in March, we bring uh, our new capacity statistics. And in fact, that's more up to date with than what Ember's slide showed, which I think was based on BNEF from February. Ours are actually based on all the, the government's official statistics. And yes, I mean, you know, a record 473 gigawatts of renewables, mostly from solar. Excellent. Um, however, I think, you know, I totally agree with Bruce. There are a lot of challenges ahead. I mean, before I talk about the outlook to 2030, I think it's important for us to recognize, of course, this happened, happened out of nowhere. Um, if we look at countries like China, the supportive energy and industrial policies were absolutely crucial to achieving these huge capacity increases. Um, the geopolitical aspects with huge increases in energy costs undoubtedly played a role for record growth, for example, of distributed solar in many countries, whether it's Australia, some European countries, India, United States, United States also, of course, supportive policy inflation reduction act. So the conducive policies, geopolitical developments, and of course, over time, and it's all interlinked, the, the falling costs have been really important. But then if we look at, I mean, of course, we were also very encouraged to see that excellent commitment to tripling where we work together with the GRA and the COP28 presidency to really drive that home as an important thing to agree. But at the moment, one of our concerns is if we then look at official policy documents, which is one way of assessing, well, where are we going to get to by 2030? I mean, first of all, in the NDCs, nationally determined contributions at the moment, the, the commitments that are listed in there are only half of what's required to triple renewable energy, uh, renewable power capacities. Okay, we know that member states, um, UNFCCC member states will be asked to update their NDCs. I mean, that is something to highlight. But even if we look at um, countries' published energy strategies and national plans, we still see a shortfall. So this is concerning because, you know, as I said, conducive policies are absolutely essential. So the rate we are going, we, we I mean, we, we just recently brought out uh, tracking 28, um, COP28 outcomes. I mean, at the moment, we still feel we're not on track because, as Bruce already said, we need to get to uh, 11, figure 11,000. Um, well, that we, we basically need more than 1,000 gigawatts. Um, Per year at the moment we're at 473. It will be a major challenge. 
And then, of course, there are a number of things we've already heard. I'd like to also highlight sub-Saharan Africa specifically. I mean, Africa as a whole, yes, we already heard, is sort of less than 2% of global finance for renewables. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, where we also have a huge electricity access deficit, we see only less than zero, less than 1% of the global total, only 3.6 billion out of 1.3 trillion of the investment going there. So just quickly, um, then the enablers, uh, and I don't need to repeat everything Bruce said, I, I just want to pick up the financing again for this one, you know, especially addressing this deficit uh, in the developing world, we do need Inter more international collaboration, more public funding, innovative funding, um, de-risking policies. So clearly we need the multilateral development banks and other development partners to be very active there together with the national governments. But let me uh, also mention uh, a couple of other areas. Uh, one is skills, you know, we're, we're still struggling with skills in many countries. We actually need governments to develop skills, policies, and programs to ensure, you know, we have enough people who can, uh, well, obviously work in the electricity sector, but also install the heat pumps and the chargers and everything. And I think, I mean, our work at Irina has shown that that is an area where much more needs to be done from the primary, from the secondary education up to university, up to skilling of existing workers. So that's important. And then on the policy side as well, we need to think a bit beyond just continuously pushing for cost reductions, which um, power auctions have been quite instrumental in. But let's think as well about the economic benefits we can get because this energy transition needs to also yield development benefits, economic benefits and not leave people behind. So. The role of government is fundamental in, in all of these. And then of course, working together with the private sector. Great. Th thanks so much Uta, for that. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to call Mr. Benny uh, Suryadi from the ASEAN Center for Energy. Uh, and this Ember's data shows that Southeast Asian countries are actually behind the global average on renewables, particularly for solar and wind, which provide just 4% of the region's electricity. So like Bruce said, there's a huge inequality in the regions that are going clean and the regions that aren't. And it won't really work if even if we achieve this 11K clean energy goal, if only like a few regions of the country are contributing to that uh, renewable transition. So Mr. Suryadi, could you tell us a bit about what it will take for this extremely important ASEAN region to harness its renewable potential? What is What is stopping it from going clean right now? Right. Um, thank you, CB, and thank you, Ember. Uh, a big fan of Ember work. Uh, so uh, it's really an honor to be invited in this important launching event. And on that question, I mean, it's not a proud moment um, representing the Southeast Asia on that 4% uh, numbers. Uh, but let, let me share some thought that's going to be um, Asia, 10 countries, we have a, a diverse renewable energy resource. And uh, each of the country have a different um, uh, situation, potential, and the direction on harnessing its potential. Uh, most of the our renewable energy uh, for electricity comes from the best lot, you know, such as uh, hydropower, while the VRE still confronts uh, some challenge. Um, in ASEAN, we have a regional aspirational target to achieve a certain renewable energy share in ASEAN. So uh, our target is to having 23% of renewable energy share in our total primary energy mix uh, with a specific target on the uh, power, 35% of renewable energy share in the power installed capacity by next year, 2025. On the power, actually we have a good progress. Uh, based on the latest data that we have in 2022, um, ASEAN are still on track to achieve its target on renewable energy um, on the power sectors, uh, which is currently around 33.5% uh, of the renewable energy share in the installed capacity. However, it is true also that uh, uh, VREs, the solar and wind, face a challenge in terms of the infrastructure constraints, just a grid constraint or regulatory uh, framework, 
a technical capability. Uh, but even though that uh, RE share in store capacity is around 33%, uh, the share in the power generation coming from RE is only around 24%. Uh, I recall back in 2012, uh, more than 10 years ago, the majority of its store capacity is uh, coming from the fossil fuels, almost 99% uh, from the ready to dispatch, uh, which are so uh, evident with generative. But uh, today, that the solar and wind uh, energy saw a massive expansion in ASEAN. Uh, where you share it in store capacity around 29 gigawatt. So around 125 times than the level in the 10 years ago. Uh, but uh, by 2022, wind and solar energy accounted for around 9, 10% uh, of the total installed. But then the contribution of total electricity generation was only 2.4. It's in fact actually less than uh, uh, what is being uh, earlier. But... Um, that's on the power sector, but we also have a challenge on the non-power sector, which is more bigger. So the transportation sector is, 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 a, is a very, I mean, a very challenging sector for ASEAN to address an issue of renewable energy because it's really heavily on the fossil fuel for its transportation sector. EV comes to the tables, but uh, we seeing is only around 2.5% um, of the EV sales expected um, in the coming years in the ASEAN region. Uh, but then to harness its potential, I mean, we, I mean, we are looking at the context of regional collaboration is the one way to accelerate it. Um, at the ASEAN Center for Energy, uh, we work on the solving, um, trying to solve the problem through the regional collaboration. So to maximize the utilization, we work on the ASEAN power grids. So to mobilize the renewable resource from the countries, one country to our neighboring countries. Um, so we have a, a balance on the supply and demands. Uh, we also work on the creating adoption uh, 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 through the renewable energy certificate, which also expected can help boost renewable energy uh, adoption. Um, but then also I call the point mentioned earlier by two um, speaker that uh, the international support is very crucial for our transition. I mean, um, it has to go in one way that cannot left behind. Um, so it's also very crucial, be it through the technology transfer financial support of the capacity building. And specifically on the investment of financial support, then I think uh, this is also where I'd like to emphasize uh, from our study, A study, this is also a core of the similar finding from IRENA studies. For ASEAN to achieve our renewable energy target, we need minimum 30 billion US dollar every year. Uh, but then historically, I mean, for the last five, 10 years, it only attracts seven to eight uh, million of the investment from renewable energy. So it's just a massive gap that needs to be fulfilled. So the internal support is very crucial to helping us just at least on the same pace with others uh, region in the world. I stop here. Thank you, Zimi. Great. Thank you so much, all. Um, we have a few questions. And before I get to that, I'd actually like to ask one question of the panelists, maybe of uh, colleagues from Ember. Could you tell us what is it that you find that's happened in this in this uh, in the ana latest analysis? Like, is it about increase in energy storage, or is there some new interesting development that has happened? Because, like you say, this trend of RE growth has been uh, incredible, but it has been happening now for about a decade or so. However, we are still very far from what is needed to really achieve any meaningful change. So. Is there some kind of technological intervention? Is there some kind of really exciting development that can, you know, like kind of challenge the narrative of doing, you know, just a little but not enough when it comes to clean energy? Uh, please, anyone would like to respond to this uh, from Ember, please do so. Yeah, I just um, have a, a quick word on that first. I think that um, everyone's got used to talking about that rise in solar pa uh, power that happened during 2023, but so much of it happened towards the end of the year. And when we're looking, sitting here now, looking at kind of um, generation for 2023 and um, um, saw that there was still a small rise in emissions, um, uh, that's really missing the point of what is about to come like that, that that, that big rise in solar power generation will be seen this year and it will lead to a fall in emissions. And I believe that's going to catch an awful lot of people out. And 
so when we're talking about you guys, the video kind of like trying to kind of tease out specific technologies in this, um, like within like uh, solar, solar by itself was halved in price in the last 12 months. But with that rise in um, battery manufacturing capacity, the fall in prices for that, that, um, that, that becomes a bit of a game changer for solar, for how solar power can be used in itself. They can now be used to store that it's not just providing electricity during the daylight hours. So, um, so I'm, uh, I'm excited about all the renewable technologies out there, but I, I, I think that the biggest uncertainty of just how how much this could explode really lies with solar, and I find that very exciting. Okay, thanks so much. So uh, I think it'll be good to get to some of the questions uh, 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 participants have asked. asked uh, Mr. Bobby Smith has asked, uh, uh, and Nicholas has chosen to answer this, do you view the recent drop-off in hydro generation as a one-off or does this indicate a potential trend due to changing weather patterns? If it's longer term, do you have any insights on how much additional wind or solar will be needed to make up for the shortfall? Nicholas. Yes, yeah, so it's a it's a really difficult question, um, but a really important one. So we have a huge amount of hydro generation that is currently on the grid and it is still providing a large part of our renewables generation. Um, and so given that we've seen uh, the capacity factor, which is essentially the ability for existing hydropower to produce electricity generation, as we've seen that drop and those hydropower plants become less efficient. Um, we're really, uh, this is a really important moment for wind and solar to step up to fill that gap already. Now, to the question of whether this is a long term event, the IPCC's analysis on this is a little bit mixed. So the expectation is that there will be regions, such as, for example, Nordic countries in Europe. Um, some parts of Latin America that might actually see heightened hydro generation or better hydro conditions just because of increased and changing rainfall patterns. But then there are other regions. Uh, we've seen droughts, significant droughts last year in China and also in um, in the Mediterranean, in Europe as well, for example, that are likely to, to have their hydro conditions significantly worsen. So these trends are very long term and we might only see some of these effects uh, come Come really uh, into play throughout throughout uh, this century, but they are certainly really important factors to consider. And if anything, a faster rollout of other renewable sources will buffer against uh, uh, some of these risks because we can't can't really take the chance. Thanks. Uh, a question here from the participants, essentially asking while the technology and economics are driving change. Uh, he's asking if uh, politics might not throw in a spanner in the works. And, uh, you know, given that populism is gaining ground across the world, uh, Dave, you would like to answer this? Yeah, um, I maybe someone from the panel might want to join in as well and give their opinion. It's a really um, important question. Um, I mean, um, it is concern about that, that, that the swing toward the, towards populism, what that will mean for the transition in total. Um, um, of course, um, from my perspective, there's all sorts of levers about how that um, how investment comes in, um, and uh, um, actually, uh, like ultimately, it's it's the public uh, opinion in total um, uh, and the weight of public opinion that swings into that. Whether not just in terms of the directly the um, elected leaders in this, so. But the, the thing that I guess kind of concerns me a little bit more than that swing towards populism, which has kind of been happening for a few years now, is 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 making sure there's no backsliding on on the opposite side that's evening that out, making sure that there's um, there's enough strong support and belief that the clean transition is the right thing to be doing and that it's going to be delivering results. And I'm um, and I'm really excited that we would be at this turning point that we can actually start pointing towards uh, just a global level emissions started falling from as soon as this year i think that that's what's been that's 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 been lacking a little bit and when that comes out i think that will really um show people what it is worth fighting for um in this um yeah bruce yeah, thanks, Dave. I completely agree. And it's that dynamic between politics and policy. As I said, we need, as an industry, long-term uh, market signals. We need investor confidence, which comes from long-term policy frameworks. And if politics you know, interferes with that, as we see from time to time, then it undermines that our ability to, to invest at scale. 
And your very good point about the social acceptance piece, you know, we need that social license to, to operate and to scale renewables to 11,000 gigawatts by 2030 and beyond 2050, we will nef- definitely need, you know, social acceptance because although politics is, you know, uh, up here, we build at a local level. And that's where, you know, we need early engagement with communities, show direct benefits to communities, and, uh, and demonstrate, you know, the benefits of renewables um, beyond, you know, the traditional fossil fuels, and maintain that over the coming years. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Uta, would you like to go? Yeah, yeah, just just quickly. I mean, first of all, let's not forget we had more than 130 countries signing up to this tripling pledge. So there is a strong commitment, and these are countries with governments from all sorts of political uh, persuasions. So that's excellent. I mean, in the end, renewables speak for themselves nowadays. You know, you can obviously build a utility scale solar plant much or, or the, the equivalent capacity of a, of a nuclear plant much quicker, the costs are lower, etc. But I totally agree with this. We need the social acceptance. Uh, we need to ensure the environmental impacts are minimized. Uh, there are also sort of things like so, in so many countries, it's still, you know, the, the people who actually want to participate in this thing, you know, being having it solar panels on your roof, for example, it's still so complicated in many countries. So we need to also uh, improve the procedures to allow people to see, well, we can be part of this. I'd like to actually ask a quick follow-up and anyone in the panel can respond. Say in India, for example, in many regions of the global south, fossil energy provides millions of jobs, which frankly renewable energy is not set up to provide. So how will this kind of just transition to clean energy happen? And uh, we can't obviously say that those jobs can, cannot be replaced because that will mean millions are pushed into further poverty and in a hurt into further hardship than they already experienced. So how do you square both of this? Uh, anyone who would like to respond, please feel free to do so. Well, yeah, Sibi, maybe I jump in there from an industry point of view. We are not advocating to immediately switch from fossil fuels to renewables. First of all, it's not realistic. And the unforeseen, well, the foreseen consequence would be exactly as you see, as you say, not just on jobs, but also access to energy. So this is a transition. It is a long-term transition. It only needs to happen once. Once it's done and the renewables are installed, okay, there's operation and maintenance, but you will then have clean, reliable electricity, uh, so affordable energy access, and the new renewable deployment will, of course, bring with it a lot of jobs. So it's a long-term transition. It has to be done extremely carefully, uh, you know, in a fair and just and equitable way. But that's what we're saying. It's going to take 20, 30 years to do this. Once it's done, you know, it's done. Thanks. Right. Great. Um, there's still one open question here that I'd like to ask. I, if I understand right, basically the participant is asking, uh, uh, and Bruce, I think you want to answer this, about how, how much flexibility is needed in the system in terms of energy storage, demand response, et cetera and how this could support even higher renewable penetration. Maybe without going into too, too much of like specifics or too much of the technology involved, you could answer at a broader level, what kind of interventions might be needed for the 60% tripling goal uh, to be met? Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, I can't give you a figure, exact figure right now, but what I will say is, and it goes to your question, Sibi, about uh, what technologies are game-changing. And in fact, on the renewable generation side, we have the technologies. So we have um, cost-effective, deployable technologies available. But as you say, as that scales up, we need then flexibility. And flexibility is the key word. So demand-side response, but also supply-side flexibility. And uh, one example, a great example is just last week, the G7 agreed to support uh, a commitment to a global energy storage target. And their number was 1,500 gigawatts by 2030 to support 11,000 gigawatts of uh, renewables. The second is grids. And so new grids, so interconnectors, but also using existing grids better with new technologies. And that was another question in the chat I saw. Uh, and digitalization. So sophisticated, smart 
grid management can also can also help a lot. And that's why we have long duration energy storage, but also green hydrogen as part of the alliance to support on that critical flexibility piece. Yeah, sorry to jump in. Um, Sibi has had a few internet connection issues um, and perhaps in the final two minutes. Um, oh, Sibi, do we have you back? Hi. Yeah, hi. Hey. Sorry, just lost <laughs> the internet. Yeah. Um, great. I think unless there are any more questions, I think this was really interesting and super insightful. And thanks so much again for everyone. Yeah, and thank you so much, Ember, for this report. Uh, Hannah, if there's nothing else, maybe we can say our goodbyes and wrap up the session. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Sibi. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of the panelists um, and to all the Ember colleagues who, who joined on the webinar today. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much.